Welcome to the Ballpark Digest Broadcaster Chat. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler, rejoined by Kevin Reichard and by Mick Gillespie. Kevin, it's good to see that you're feeling better. I am. I'm out of bed. I spent most of the last week in bed writhing in pain, so it was it was not a very pleasant experience. So I'm I'm eating real food again and, and all full of vim and vigor. Mick, how are you doing? Yeah, doing well, man. Uh you know, it's been a lot of fun kind of getting back behind the microphone again, doing a little work with college football and, uh, you know, and I'm paying attention to this, this playoffs, um, really, really, uh, tough loss for the Braves, you know, and, uh, but give the Dodgers a lot of credit. I think that that was, uh, about as good of a playoff series as, as we're going to see. Well, we've talked about baseball promoting itself for the future. The Braves are going to be around for a while with all their young talent. Like we saw earlier in the playoffs with the Padres, the White Sox, and you can keep on going down. A lot of homegrown talent making itself known in this postseason. Yeah, I'll tell you what, the Braves, I mean, they, they had it, you know. It, that series reminded me of the Cubs World Series win over the Indians, where the Indians just, they had the 3-1 advantage, and they, they, but they had some injuries to their starting pitching. And the Braves dealt with the same thing. You know, especially Mike Soroka, not having him, that, that really hurts. But they never really got in that, that spot where they could just, like, throw everything at the Dodgers and, and try to put them away. And um, the, the thing about baseball, it's so weird, though, is you got all these young players you expect to be back. You know, who would have thought that the Cubs wouldn't be back, you know, when, when they had all those guys? So you got you to gotta seize on the opportunity when it's there. But you're right. I mean, the Padres are fun to watch. The, the White Sox kind of had a tough loss in their playoffs, and they're making some changes, but they expect to be back. Uh, comes down to the Dodgers to me. I think they just run the organization the right way. When they make trades, they don't trade away their top, top talent. You know, they give some guys away, but they, uh, they've built a team that I think is going to win this year and, and maybe win some more. But they've been able to – Look at one of the greatest pitchers of the generation in Clayton Kershaw and say to him, it's okay, we got your back. Yeah, yeah. And he had, he's been average in the playoffs, you know. Like, uh, he's had some tough losses. You know, he's pitched some good games too. But, yeah, I mean, like, they're not really even relying on him too much right now, you know. And it's weird to think that, like, he's kind of one of the older guys. Kevin. Yeah, I, I watched the Dodgers game a little bit. I, I, I'm, I was amazed they came back in this series, quite honestly. But I think, I think, Jesse, you and I talked about at the beginning of the playoffs where the Dodgers were going to be intimidated because they had all these arms in the bullpen. And the same now with, with Tampa. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a team – those are two teams that are they're kind of built along the same lines in a weird way, despite the, the, the total disparities in the payroll – um, but philosophically, you have a lot of the same things going on with both. Um, I'm lucky I didn't dislodge my shoulder, uh, dislocate my so shoulder uh, celebrating any time recently, however. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see who, who, uh, whose bullpen can, can get the wins. So the way that I see the World Series is Tampa Bay, in my mind, the way that they beat you is the old pitching and defense, right? What we would talk about old school football, we're trying to grind it out. And once they get that slim lead, then they just put it in the hands of their stable of arms and they trust their defense to turn balls and play into outs. And whoever it is, whether it's a Fairbanks, whether it's an Anderson, whether it's a Castillo, who's ever coming in from the bullpen at the end of games, they're just going to trust that their relievers are going to be better than your relievers. The Blue Jays have a pretty darn good offense, and they beat them. The Yankees have a great offense, and they beat them. The Astros have a great offense, and though the Astros did get to them, uh, Carlos Correa took Nick Anderson deep for a walk-off. Fairbanks had command issues, and there was a game where it looked like they were kind of getting to Diego Castillo. In the end, the Rays won, and they won game seven via pitching. So now they're going to take on a Dodgers team that I would argue the way that I perceived it the Braves beat the Reds and the Marlins by pitching. Five games, five and oh, four shutouts. And they took on the Dodgers and they had the 3-1 lead and they went to their bullpen and the Dodgers got the big hits against the Braves' bullpen. A.J. Minter gave one up. 
Kike Hernandez and Cody Bellinger are the big swings in the final game, but there are great Braves arms in the pen and the Dodgers beat them. So I think that the World Series is going to be the same thing is will the Dodgers do the same thing against Anderson, Fairbanks, and Castillo? And if they do, the Dodgers win. And if they don't, the Rays will beat the Dodgers the same way they beat the prior three teams, which is low scoring, great defensive, and very tense games. Yeah, well, look, I, I feel like the Dodgers are the best team in baseball. I mean, I, I said it at the beginning. I was looked at, like, all the wins they had, and I knew that it was going to be in the 60-game season pretty phenomenal uh, how many games they could win, and they did. You know, they, they were tremendous. The, this team, by adding Mookie Betts, Mookie Betts changed the, ser- the series. And what's crazy is it wasn't with his bat. It was with his glove. You know, he made three amazing catches over the wall. He made a diving catch to – you know, and then threw a guy out at the plate in another game. You know, like, he's he's a difference maker. Um, if I was a Red Sox fan and I'm watching that, I would probably wouldn't be too happy about seeing maybe one of two of the most dynamic players in the game uh, playing for the Dodgers. And I just feel like that after – this is what I think. Dodgers in five, I just feel like they have – they they had to deal with that, that almost losing thing. I bet you that they're going to play so loose against the Rays. They've just got too much firepower and pitching too. Um, I'd, I'd be shocked if, if the Rays win more than one game against them. I think that the Dodgers have been a team on a mission. And, you know, it's like in, in any story, it's like you have to have that, like, you know, here to make it great. And then I just, I feel like it's their year, but, I, there's there's always someone else, you know, there's Jock Peterson, Cody Bellinger, you just keep going through it, Mookie Betts, like, having four games in a series makes it so tough to be, to win in an upset, you know, because you have to just keep going out there, um, and it, it, there's no flukes to me in, a, in the best of seven, you know, in a best of seven game series, I just don't see that, and I, and I also listened to the Rays post game, and they were talking about, you know, uh, I heard Kevin Cash saying, you know, was this the, one of the greatest moments in his life besides having his kids or whatever. And I thought, yeah, it is. And you guys are content right now. And the Dodgers are like, hey, this is where we expect it to be. But we didn't expect to just get there. We expect to win it. It, it almost reminds me of Alabama in the uh, 2008 SEC championship game you know, they, they set a goal, like, to get to the SEC championship game. My friend Mike Johnson, who was on the team, told me this. And he said that we got there, we're in this game with Florida, and we're like, okay, yeah. So they lose, and they, they get back together, and they're like, you know, we set our goals too low. You know, the goal is to beat Florida and to win the national championship game. They come back in 09, and they do that. And I know it's two different sports, but it's still one winning mentality. You know, the, the, the point is, is that they should have thought from the beginning, like, we can be the best team in the country. And I feel like it's the same thing with the Dodgers. They've been here so many times, and they're back again. But this team has had this one goal to win the World Series. They've been close. And I just, I, I don't know, I'd be just absolutely shocked if uh, Tampa Bay even made this a series. So if the Dodgers lose, are we going to start talking about the curse of the Dodgers? I don't know. I mean, if they lose, uh, I don't, if, if they lose, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, like, it'd be hard to kind of come back again, you know, but they have great players to do it. Um, that'd be interesting. I mean, like, it would be interesting just to see how they would deal with having a, a, a season where they, you know, they get back to the World Series again and they're not playing a team. Sorry for the noise, guys. The, uh, they, they're not playing a team that's stealing signs. And, um, you know, and using video to cheat, you know, and then they lose it, you know, like there's no, there, there's no excuses. And I mean, like that, that series that they lost against Houston, it really had lasting effects on, you know, not just that team, but the players on that team. I mean, look at you, Darvish, you know, his confidence was just gone for a while. You know, he had two World Series games where it just seemed like the Astros had his number, you know, and come to find out they had his pitches, you know, and then the confidence that he got when that came out, it's like, oh, wait a second. You know, I'm still good. You know, um, 
So I, I don't know. I just feel like that this team has had this, just this, this single focus to win this world series. And I, 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 I don't know. I get, I just, in my mind, this is an easy one. Kevin, I love your note that this is going to be the fourth world series ever in which every game will be played in the same stadium. Yeah. It's an amazing, amazing stat. Um, as everyone knows, it's being played in Texas under semi-quarantine conditions. Um, and sort of a, and that alone is a unique circumstance. The last one was in St. Louis in 1944 when the Cardinals and the Brownies made it to the Boats of the World Series. So every game was at Sportsman's Park. Uh, before that, the 21 and 22 series were, were both played at the polo grounds. So... Globe Life becomes sort of a, a part of a story tradition of ballparks with Sportsman's Park and, and the polo grounds. Um, it, it is historically weird to, to think that, that the three ballparks are, are going to be sort of regarded in the same way for the rest of, of, of our lives. And, you know, we're, 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 we're young enough to, to not – have remembered the 1944 World Series, much less any Brownies action ever. So uh, the, the history is, is I, I, hope, I hope the broadcast tonight really recognizes that history and goes into it. The 44 Series had Mizuel. It had a whole bunch of, of players popping up and, and, uh, and making a name for themselves at Sportsman's Park. I think it was also famous for being a terribly played World Series, especially on the part of the Browns, because it's World War II, so still there's so much talent that is missing from the game. So the St. Louis Browns were first in shoes, first in booze, last in the American League. Exactly. And for the first time and the only time, the St. Louis Browns won the American League. And then you fast forward a decade and they were the Baltimore Orioles. But there yeah. they were, finally playing they had won the pennant. They're looking for the title, and they run into their crosstown rival, and the Cardinals just hose them. Yeah, yeah. It was it was not a particularly good looking series on, on any level. If you look at the old photos and and footage of the of, of of the era, Sportsman's Park, the they were almost playing on dirt. You know, the infield was in such bad shape in the fall that I, I'm sure it was a terrible experience for both sides. But you know, during wartime it became even bigger news when both teams made it, especially with the Brownies making it when people, you know, they were, they, they weren't quite the Cubs of their era, but they were certainly underdogs to a great extent. And then they get totally wiped out and, you know, moments that'll live in infamy, you know, and the Cardinals and, and people forget though, that before that the Cardinals were sort of the underdog team in St. Louis, the Brownies owned a uh, sportsman's park. They were actually the better draw for many years than the Cardinals and the 44 series sort of was the beginning of the end for the Browns in terms of the fans, in terms of, of how the rest of the world viewed the team. And, and you're right. They, after Bill Beck worked to on a few different plans to move the team, he finally just sold it and they ended up in Baltimore instead of Minneapolis or Los Angeles, which is where he preferred to have them go. Yeah. Let me jump in on this too. You bring up something that kind of uh, touches um, some thoughts that I've had lately too. Uh, one of my one of my buddies, uh, we called him the dean of Baltimore broadcasting. And Jesse, you might have known about Vince Bagley. He was um, this this Baltimore sports legend. And Vince and I were good friends. He passed away last week. Uh, I I remember talking to Vince. He grew up in Baltimore about when the the, the Browns moved to Baltimore. You know, and this parade that they had, and just the 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 amazing excitement that people in the city had about getting a major league team again, you know, cause they hadn't had one in a long time. Um, and it was the Browns. And I didn't realize that the Browns played in the 44 world series until you just said it is somewhere besides, you know, wherever. And, and it's like, um, it, and, and, and it's crazy to think like in 1944, here they are in the world series. And in 1953, you know, they're getting ready to move. They're having a parade with with like the whole city in Baltimore excited about having them after being this like you know I don't know second thought type franchise in St. Louis but uh, my friend Vince Bagley who was the the Colts broadcaster with Chuck Thompson and like you know li lived 93 great years you know hearing him tell me the first-hand accounts of what it was like 
when when the you know the, these guys are here and they're going to be the new Orioles. Uh, you know, I always just ma imagined like what that must have been like, you know, to be able to sit out there as he's a kid and he's out there and he's cheering, you know, hey, look, these guys are coming to town. And then to go from a franchise that didn't win a lot to becoming, you know, in a dynasty where they were one of the all time greats, you know, from from 1966 until 1983, where they're in the World Series a lot. They're always contenders. You know, they've, they've got this this thing going where it's like, you know, you have some of the same guys from 66 on the team in 83, which is crazy to think that, like Jim Palmer, won games in both of those World Series. The only guy to ever win a World Series game in three decades, you know. Uh, and, and, they've and you know, Baltimore is kind of one of those franchises in baseball that has a very rich history. But it's not that deep, you know, when you look at the fact that they were the Browns and they came from St. Louis and, you know, in the 50s. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll, I'll miss Vince Bagley, too. Um, you know, just kind of talking about, like, what his career was like uh, and another franchise leaving when the Colts left, they, they snuck out in the middle of the night, right? They got these Mayflower trucks in a, in a snowstorm in the middle of the night. Vince found out about it. You guys can go check this out on YouTube because it's still out there. And Vince was, was uh, with, uh, I think WBAL TV. He, sh he shows up and, and is like, asking everybody what's going on, you know, like, like uh, Mike Wallace type stuff from 60 minutes, you know, and it's just, so what it's, that's another like iconic Baltimore sports moment, but kind of what he brought to the table, um, you know, just talking about him, but back to the world series, you know, like um, it, 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 I'm just glad that we're playing the world series. And I'll tell you something else I like a lot guys is that the way that it's been set up besides yesterday, we've had baseball every day. Like, I love it. Like, I love the fact that we're not, okay, we're taking two days off the travel or we're doing it for TV. No, it's like, hey, look, we got to play this. We don't want any COVID sneaking in here. Let's just go. And it changed the way that you could set up your pitching. That certainly hurt Atlanta in their series against the Dodgers. But you could say it hurt the Dodgers as well, and they were just able to persevere. Uh, but it's been fun knowing, like, every single day I got a baseball game. I want to go back, uh, just connecting the whole idea of the sad sack Browns becoming the dominant Orioles. I was talking to a friend yesterday about this World Series. So the Dodgers, we now think of the Dodgers being a great team for the last five years, but also the Dodgers of the 80s and Tommy Lasorda and the Dodgers of the 70s and the Dodgers of the 60s of Walter Alston and the 50s. And you go back, the Brooklyn Dodgers for the first, what, four decades were terrible and were the sad sack of the National mm -hmm. League. And then on the other side, the Tampa Bay Rays, okay, they're in the World Series right now. But what was the Tampa Bay Devil Rays persona? What was the reputation? How did people perceive the Tampa Bay Devil Rays? Was that they were the worst for years upon years after they came into being. They came into being with the Arizona Diamondbacks. The Diamondbacks in two years were in the playoffs, taking on the Mets in a great series The Todd Pratt beat them. And then two years later, they were beating Mariano Rivera for the World Series. And on the other side, there were the Devil Rays stuck in the basement. So that you could go, once again, these sad sacks turned into good, solid franchises where the Dodgers are now royalty in baseball. And the Rays have made something of themselves with the ways that they have constructed their organization. You know, it's amazing to me that, that speaking of that broader sad sack trend, there's still six major league teams that have not won – a World Series was just as amazing to me that there's six of them left. Tampa, okay, I that makes sense. Frequent expansion team, you know, recent, but there's still five more, and it'll be and some of them like Texas will won't be there next year probably or the year after even. So if Tampa doesn't win this year, we could see six next year and the year after and the year after that. You know, the other point too is that if if the fans in Tampa Bay don't uh, rally around this team I would not be surprised if they're not the St. Louis Browns of this generation and they don't move to a Nashville that's pushing really hard to get a team and I think would be an excellent market for Major League Baseball or Charlotte or somewhere else that if they put the team there uh, that people would go and support that that team you know maybe even Montreal you know you've heard that but I, I feel like that this is a really important time for their franchise because them and Oakland both are 
are really playing on borrowed time, in my opinion. I mean, at the end of the day, these are businesses. And, it, and if you're not able to make the money to be able to keep the business going strong, then, some, then they're going to move somewhere where you can do that. And that's kind of the situation with St. Louis when they were the Browns. You know, they, they were competing with another team. Uh, Tampa Bay is competing with good weather and Yankees fans. You know, that there's a ton of Yankees fans down there. They don't get it. They go to see the – when the Yankees come to town, then all of a sudden they have fans, maybe even some Red Sox. Uh, but I just – there's so many good markets for baseball that are better than Tampa Bay support wise. And what I'm hoping is for Tampa Bay fans to, to, to kind of use this as that experience where, you know, now they become endeared by this, this franchise. Uh, and I get a great example to me was that, you know, when the Colts left Baltimore, you know, I was a Cowboys fan, not a, not a skins fan. I was a, a Cowboys fan. And then when uh, one of my friends got me to go to the playoff game, in 2000, they ended up winning the Super Bowl. So I became a Ravens fan. I was there and I was like, you know, this experience with all of my friends and my community, we, the 20 of us went when they, uh, they played uh, the Broncos. It was a cold, really cold day. And it was just one of those experiences where I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm a Raven. You know, I'm a Baltimore fan. And so what I'm hoping is for Tampa Bay, maybe, you know, enough people get that experience. Obviously, they're not going to get to go to the game. But, um, you know, just by, by sitting there and watching, and pulling for their city, and you know, maybe they could be like the, the, the Tampa Bay Bucks, you know, who have who have really won over the city, and they don't have attendance issues. Um, and I, I guess that's a big part of it, you know, like but because in, in ten years they could be somewhere else if people don't jump on the bandwagon and support them. Yeah, Tampa's. I think it's a little bit more solid market maybe than you do because I think there's other metrics. Uh, to, to evaluate success. The TV ratings are, are really good for the Rays in Tampa. I mean, top 12, I believe, in Major League Baseball and, and more than, than what you would expect in other markets. It's an interesting market because the Bucks. you mentioned the Bucks, but you know who really rules that market? Lightning. The Lightning. Really? Oh, God. And they yes. won. You yeah, Stanley they won. Cup champions. Oh, they're Stanley Cup champion. They sell out. There is buzz around games. I went to a lightning game last spring. You get those Tesla coils going, <laughs> the fans cheering. It is an amazing experience. And so I, I think I, in Tampa, you put the ballpark in the right location and you get that, that, that last piece there. And I think it can be a really dynamic experience. So I, I think yeah. the Rays are, are smart to be patient. There's some political it, – it's Florida, so there's always weird political crap going on uh, in, in the city. But um, I'm, I'm less convinced they're going to move maybe than you are. And there's also one big reason why I don't think they'll move to a Nashville or Charlotte. Expansion fees. That's true. MLB That's true. doesn't make a dime with them moving to Nashville. Yeah, Nashville yeah. Paying a billion in expansion fees, that, that affects every team's bottom line. Yeah, yeah, so. I agree. Look, new stadium, I mean, you're the guy, you're the, you're the uh, you know, the authority on stadiums. If they get a new stadium in Tampa Bay, and I'm guessing it would be like one of the retractable roof type places because you have to have a roof there. It's so hot. Uh, it's a game changer. And they have been consistently – uh, good in the minor leagues you know when I look at all of the great players that they've had come through there and and they've done a great job of scouting and development I mean just excellent and I've seen a lot of these guys come through and there's no like super superstar type player there's just a bunch of little gnats that get on base and work counts and they they all just play together um you know they're Wonder the kind Franco. of team that you get ready yeah, they're, they're the kind of team that you hate but you like, but you, if you were playing on that team, you would love it, you know, because they're, they're just one through, you know, nine in that lineup. There's somebody that can be a pest. They're like the little piranhas. Remember the 91 twins and the White yeah. Sox had a lot more talent in that era, but the, the twins always beat them and they would call them the little piranhas because yep. no one, no one killed you individually, but man, that team just swarmed and struck when it was, when it needed a win. And Tampa's a lot the same way. I totally agree with you. The Tampa and Los Angeles are currently the centers of the sports universe. The Lakers, the champions, beating, sorry, Miami. The Tampa Bay Lightning, 
champions of the NHL. Now we've got Tampa against Los Angeles for the World Series. There's every possibility that Tom Brady and Tampa Bay will take on the LA Rams in the <laughs> NFC playoffs. And who knows about Justin Herbert and the Chargers down the road, but good things going on in those cities right now, sports-wise. Isn't it funny how those waves happen? I mean, yeah. all, all of a sudden, there'll be multiple teams competing uh, for, for fans' attention. And yeah, Boston think about it. That well. Right, I was going to say that. Well, think about all those years, like, the, the Celtics were good, and then all of a sudden, they weren't good anymore. And Boston had, you know, had them won a World Series in forever, right? They had the curse of the Bambino, and, you know, the, 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 the Patriots stunk, and then, you know, all of a sudden you turn around and the Celtics are winning one and the Red Sox are winning three and the Patriots are winning. I don't know how many they won, six or something, you know. And the Bruins won. And the Bruins. Yeah. Yeah, and the Bruins, right. Yeah, I mean, like, it, that, that, that's like, uh, that's one way to spoil your city right there when you win like that. I mean, Washington, D.C., we had the Caps, the Nats, the Mystics all in a row, which was pretty yeah. awesome. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I love this. So here we are right on the cusp of the World Series, and this has been just a sprint of a baseball season all the way to the end. The ALCS and the NLCS were great. We'll see how the World Series is, but we've had some tremendous World Series in recent years. Last year was a great World Series. We can talk about 2016, 27, this year after year after year. There were some years there where the World Series were non-competitive and were getting finished off in sweeps, and that is not this current era. Mm -mm. No. It just seems like there's a lot more parity right now. And I don't even know why, like, but we've had some really, really entertaining World Series, you know, no doubt about it. Kevin, I want to go back into expansion, but first, we have seen all of these games are being held at Globe Life. Is there any... As we go into the future, are they going to do this again? Or is this going to be carried forward into future major league seasons where they set up sites and stadiums for playoff rounds to be held? I don't think so. I don't think there's an appetite for it uh, unless there's COVID issues again next year, which may very well be. Um, but a World Series is such a showcase for a city. And it is such a huge reward, both in terms of generating even more local interest for a team as well as economics of it. Um, the economics of the World Series are, are, are pretty good for baseball in terms, Major League Baseball in terms of actually the actual event because they take over uh, the business of it, you know, when, when, it's in, when it's in a visiting city. So I think there'll be calls for it. I think on the one hand, it's really easy to do. It's easy to pre-sell. You don't need to worry about weather. But on the flip side, Boy, how do, you, how do you tell in two years, how do you tell Tampa if they make it back that oh, no World Series game for you? We're going we're gonna to hold it in, uh, in Minute Maid Park. You know, it's, 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 it's a lot to ask a, a fan to give up a chance at a World Series ticket. And I, I don't know, I, I assume both of you have been to World Series games. There's something about a World Series game that is just one of the, and I've been to Super Bowls, I've been to World Series. There's a there's just so much internal excitement in a city when the World Series is going on, both in the, both among fans and in the ballpark, that it's it's hard to imagine it. I mean, I was at the 91 series way back when, and it's still, my ears still ring from it. So it's, it's an amazing experience. About expansion now, how close are we, how likely? I don't think we're as close as we were, say, six months ago. I think the COVID really is throwing baseball for a loop. Um, right now, everything's very short-term in baseball. You know, they're really just working on how to, how to play next year, how to run spring training. Those debates are still going on. Uh, how to handle minor league baseball, those debates are still going on. So I don't see expansion talk really come back seriously for another year, at least. Um, I, think, I think Nashville's bid may be unraveling a little bit. Um, Dave Dombrowski's now been rumored to be looking for jobs elsewhere as when he was brought in. I mean, he's, he, he's up mentioned for the Angels job, for mm -hmm. instance. So I, I'm not entirely sure that the feeling in baseball is that expansion is going to be done anytime soon. Um, the, the COVID scares last, uh, I think, longer than Major League Baseball officials anticipated or wanted. So next year is going to be a very transitional year. Uh, in, in no matter what. 
I mean, the Angels don't have prospects for Dave Dombrowski to trade away. So I'm not sure why he would take that. <laughs> that's, maybe that's why he hasn't taken it yet. You know, that on the other hand, he's going to have an unlimited budget. Um, and he's going to have the, the, the blessing of low expectations in many ways because it can't get worse. You've got me thinking about that great trivia question about which major league teams have not won World Series now. Okay, so Tampa Bay, which is getting its chance. Texas, which had great chances, great yeah. chances. 2015 was a fabulous World Series too. Seattle Mariners, San Diego Padres, who were on the rise, who we could see them get their chance soon. I don't know the other two. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. It's such a good question. That's a really good question. Mm. If people, I had the list of teams in front of me, I'd nail it. Yeah. There are people sitting watching this going, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> Idiots, come on. <laughs> so, you know, with the baseball thesaurus, the, the baseball thesaurus, the football thesaurus, I chose last time terms that tied together, and I've got that again. And it's terms that it wasn't so long ago where you would hear these much more often. But this is inspired by Derek Henry, Alabama now Tennessee Titans. And if you're yearning for really good starting pitching, the kind that we haven't seen starters go deep in the, any of these postseason games recently, when you think about a horse, right? A horse is a great back. A workhorse is a back that you can just put the shoulder, uh, you, can, you can put the offense on their shoulders and you can ride them to victory, carry after carry. A workhorse is a pitcher who eats up inning after inning. I love that term workhorse. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I just always imagine, you know, like a mule, you know, pulling like, you know, something behind it, you know, whatever they call that thing that like, you know, plows the field, you know, and, um, it's a plow. Derrick Henry. Yeah. Let's call that a plow. Uh, Der Derrick Henry is just, he, he, he's so different than any other running back because you saw uh, the, the game that they played, uh, what was it, yesterday, you know, and, and, and it's like he gets past the line of scrimmage, and it's like this giant guy running 26 miles an hour. No one can catch him. So you're like, this guy shouldn't be able to run this fast. Now, I covered him when he was at Alabama, and they did, what, what, what they figured out was, look, we can give the ball to this guy 30, 35 times, and, it, and he's better as the game's going on. You know, like Jerome Bettis, but, but faster, you know, and more, and more agile. He just will wear you down. I, I, there was an Iron Bowl that Alabama played at Auburn, and Auburn had the lead at the half. And then the second half, I mean, they just dosed up the elixir and kept handing him the football, and then Auburn didn't want to tackle him by the end of that game. He's a, he's a special running back. I thought when he got to the NFL, the Titans were just like they, – they just didn't get it, you know. This is like going back to the 90s and Emmett Smith and, you know, the way that you used to do the running backs. Instead of by committee, you got one guy. The committee's this guy. Titans are going to be tough to beat because Derrick Henry gives them a weapon that I don't think any other team has. And with that said, he definitely is a workhorse. Yeah, NFL teams don't like to use workhorses. Have you noticed that? Yeah. They, yeah for some reason, you know, you, running back by committee seems to be very popular. You know, even, even the Vikings with, with a leading rusher, the trouble is when they lean on, on, on Cook too much, he gets hurt. Um, yeah. And you look at other college workhorses that have entered the pros, like a Jonathan Taylor, uh, the Colts haven't used him as a workhorse at all. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the, the pro game is so much better on the defensive side that you can't rely on a workhorse there. I don't know. All I know is my Washington football team released Adrian Peterson for the start of the year. And it's not like we've got anybody else on offense. So. Wouldn't be so bad to have a workhorse back that we could rely on. Well, there were some free agents. Wasn't Ferret a free agent before the beginning of the year, for instance? He's sort of a work – at LSU, is a workhorse anyway. So, it's got to be like a dozen old Alabama players out there that you could just hand it to oh. times a game. Yeah, we, 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 we churn them out. Are we, you sure there's six teams? I mean, yeah, I'm sitting here – Colorado Rockies, Rockies, by the way. I Rockies. forgot the That's one of them. Okay, so that's five. That's so, there five. is six then. So we're, it's what's that? Miami. No, Miami won. I'm sorry. Miami won one. Miami won. So I was thinking like Washington could have been one of those teams, but they won last year. And I know Houston used to be one, but they won one a couple of years ago. 
You got you're killing me over here. But yeah, the Rockies. Uh, so going back, Kevin's got to go type football. this up, or we're not going to be able to end this thing. <laughs> going back to some right some football. Remember Amos Alonzo Stag, legend of Chicago. Yeah. So they had a back who apparently, according to what I read, would rear up like a horse before they would give him the ball on a run. And they called Milwaukee. him a low back. Milwaukee. Yep. Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Oh, Brewers. I should have known that. I'm kicking myself. <laughs> yeah, that's like right near – that's your wheelhouse right there. I know, but they've made it. So you once you yeah, have once a team makes it, you sort of visualize them being there again or winning. All right. Well, Milwaukee – the Milwaukee Braves won one, right? Yes, against yeah. the Yankees. That's right. But, so yeah. The city okay. has the championship. Yes. The city has one, yeah. Except the franchise is in Atlanta. Right, exactly. All right. <laughs> this I don't know if this would be a good, you know, Tuesday night trivia team at the local pub, but we'd have fun doing it. I think part of the Tuesday night trivia is the company just enjoying everything. And yeah. there's a, so the trivia teams that I've been on, a question is asked. One person doesn't know it and doesn't care to know it. One person doesn't know it, but really wants to know it. And one person kind of has an idea but isn't sure but maybe there's some where someone absolutely knows but there's the person who's like 75 percent sure the person yeah, yeah. just doesn't care and is in it for the food and the company and so it's yeah. a great time yeah they try to get me to go for the baseball trivia you know like the younger guys would be like hey would you go and it's like i never think i know the answer and then I sit there and like, I'm like, oh yeah, like this one, you know, like I'm like, ah, oh, what could it be? You know, and then all of a sudden it just pops in there. I don't even know how. The I feel like I'm pretty I, good at it. Last time I did trivia, the, the question that tripped our team up, but not me, by the way, is, is who, who's the, who has the most wins in NBA history without ever winning a championship? Which is actually is really easy when you think about the leading, most winningest coaches in NBA history. Donnie Nelson. That's a good question. All time hmm. winning as coach. Never. I generally it. fall either I know the answer immediately or I don't know it. But I like getting trivia questions that I don't know the answers to. I don't feel worse about myself when I don't know the answer to a trivia question. Yeah, in, the, in that instance of the NBA, there was a big debate on the team as to whether it was Lenny Wilkins or Donnie Nelson. Mm. And uh, luckily, I kind of prevailed. Um, Do you know the answer to this one? Can you name the only pitcher in Major League history to lose no hitters with two outs in the ninth inning in back-to-back -back starts? Mm. I'll tell you what, that would be terrible. Probably Nolan Ryan. It's going to be someone more obscure, isn't it? Kind of obscure, but a really good pitcher in the 1980s for the Blue Jays. It's so, not Dave mm. Steve. Dave Steve. I was always going to say that. I, I, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, is it Dave Steve or Jimmy Key? And then I was like, but then Jimmy Key was kind of like later in the 80s, but he was there, right? Or was he only 90s? I think he got there in the 80s. Yeah, Dave okay. Steve was Mr. Blue Jay in the 80s, though. Yeah, yeah. Dave Steve was the exact first name that popped into my head. Okay, so let me ask each of you, and I'll, I'll give my own answer. What makes a good trivia question? I think, from my mind, what makes a good trivia question is something fun, something that, if you don't know it right away, you do want to think about it instead of immediately throwing up your hands and saying, I don't really care about that. So there's got to be something about it where you go, oh, that's, a, that's interesting. That's fun. Let me, let me try this. For each of you, what makes a good trivia question? All right, let me go first. We, we did trivia. The guys on the broadcast, the Smokies broadcast, um, obviously not this year, but last year, they loved, we had a guy, Matt Peterson, that loved trivia. So he said, hey, can we start doing trivia? Like, like we'll ask you a trivia question every day. And so um, I just get them right every day, right? So then they try to make them harder. And then, you know, like, <clears throat> I still get them right. And then all of a sudden they make them impossible. And I'm like, this is impossible. Like, there's no way I would know this. <clears throat> um, like, so I think that what makes a good trivia question is something that's not so obscure that you can't get it, 
you know, like the fun of it is seeing if you can get it. And so what the, what, you know, there was a couple where I'm like, I would have never, no one in the world's going to know that. Like, like literally, and I can't remember what those questions were, but we would talk about them afterwards or even on the air. And I'd be like, that's impossible. You know, I think it's what you, if you get, if the person gets it wrong, you want the people at home to be like, no, no, it's this, it's this, you know, like, you know, like there's, um, I'll give you a great example. I'm going to give you one right here. Name, name the, the uh, Orioles hero that hit the go ahead home run in uh, game four of the 1983 ALCS in the 10th inning to break a scoreless tie between Baltimore and the White Sox. All right. Tito Landrum. Right. So like you would know that if you, I mean, that's, that's, that hit that home run was one of the biggest home runs in the history of the Orioles. Now, not everybody's going to know that, but somebody's going to know that, you know? And, and, and so you want to find those that like, you know, kind of just to me that are there and that some people are going to get, but that aren't impossible to get. Here's another genre of them where the question is obscure but the answer is famous. So to give you an example, who is on deck when Bobby Thompson hit the shot heard around the world? Right, Willie Mays. Exactly. So right, but that's what I'm saying. Like that, that's go, the kind of stuff you who love. Who would know that? But if you know right. it's Willie Mays. Yeah, right. And that's a great question right there. And, and the funny thing about the Tito Landrum is that Britt Burns was the pitcher for the White Sox. He started the game and he pitched the entire game. He gave up the home run. And, I, and he was the Barons pitching coach. And I love Britt Burns. I think he's a great dude. And he pitched for the Smokies, too. He won a championship. And uh, the, last, the last time the Smokies won a championship on the field, he was one of the players. He was one of the pitchers on the team. And um, you, you ask him about Tito Landrum. And to the White Sox, it's Tito Landrum. You know, the F word. Tito Landrum, you know, like <laughs> – like that's the that you know that that's what that means to them like every time that guy's name comes up so yeah but that's another great one right there i love that do you know was it that dusty baker was on deck when hank aaron broke babe ruth's record was that yeah so mm -hmm. it's just it's especially when you've got dusty around doing his thing managing the heck out of the astros some trivia is just really good because the trivia leads into good stories Right. I think it was called the home run, Jesse. You know this. You've talked about Tom it. House. Right. I know. It's like that kind of stuff. Like, you know, <laughs> he ran it in. You give me that ball. They ran it in the home plate, you know. Uh, I think it was Davey Johnson, who was a teammate of Hank Aaron when he broke Babe Ruth's record, and then a teammate of Sadaharu O oh when he broke Hank Aaron's record. <laughs> I didn't know that one. Ridiculous things. Yeah. Yeah. Trivia. The greatness of trivia. That's, that's why you find new trivia books out all the time. You find trivia people popping up everywhere. You know, I think Mick described it so well, what makes a great trivia question. It's got to be solvable, but not easy. And it's mm -hmm. got to lead to further discussion. Yep, exactly. On that note, let's call it a day. Send in your finest trivia questions to Ballpark Digest. See if you can stump us. Kevin Rackard, yeah. any final thoughts? Shouldn't shouldn't be hard to stump us between the three of us, you know. Just <laughs> you know, don't make it impossible, but send them in. We'd love to love to hear them next week. Mick Gillespie, final thoughts. Yeah, if it's NBA, you got me. I'm not going to be able to answer it. But but look, guys, uh, college football though, that's my other thing. If you are looking for something to do Friday night from seven to nine Eastern time, six to eight Central on the Bama Insider YouTube channel. It's free. Watch my show. It's a tailgate show for football, but it's, it's really fun. We, we try to goof off a lot on there, and the, the show's done really well. And then uh, Bama Insider is the rival site for Alabama football. So we put a lot of work into it. We're really proud of what we do. And, um, you know, even Kevin will tell you, you don't have to be an Alabama fan to like the show. I am not an Alabama fan, and I actually enjoyed the show quite a bit. So I, I heartily concur. Thank you, sir. Watch for Kevin, for Mick. I'm Jesse Goldberg-Strassler, and this is your Ballpark Digest broadcaster chat.